Well, as you may have noticed, if you uh, are here often, we're doing things a little bit different today just because we know so many people are out. We wanted to make sure that we simplified service enough so that our volunteer base wasn't just work to death. Uh, if you don't know, if you haven't been here before at Joy Church, our our dream team does so, so, so much, and uh, and we really appreciate them, and we don't want to work them into the ground, especially when there's difficult and trying times like this. So are we ready for kids to dismiss? I'm just going to say yes. Let's just go for it. Kiddos, you guys want to go to kids' church or what? Yeah. What? Get out of here. You guys were in trouble. I'm in charge of announcements today. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what's going on around this place. <laughs> so we're making a couple of changes, just so you know, uh, programming-wise. Uh, we don't have um, any youth tonight, for one. So make sure you mark your calendars for that. Um, our connect groups. Normally, we have connect groups that meet throughout the city. And we may be doing that. We may not. But it's kind of on a... a group by group basis. So make sure that you check in with your with your group to make sure that they're going this week because if they're canceled that's you're going to want to know that. And we're not totally sure who's canceling and who's not. So check in with your with your group leader before you um uh before you just show up at one. And then also uh there's no next class today. Normally we have next track right after service um so that we can uh, get people onboarded onto the dream team, but that's not happening. Um, right away because we don't quite know what's going to be happening over the next few uh, services. We're going to talk about that today. And then lastly, for tithes and offerings, if you brought your tithe and offering today, we're not going to pass the buckets around. We're just trying to limit as much contact as we can um, from person to person and touching the same things um, just so we can try to prevent spreading. I don't know if there's any like infectious viruses out there at this point or anything. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know if I haven't been watching the news, but uh, what we do have is just a bucket right out on the front uh, counter area there outside the info center. If, uh, if you have tithes or offerings that you want to drop, you can just drop them in there uh, on your way out. That way we're not passing stuff around. So anyway, that's the announcements. How'd I do? <laughs> Pretty amazing. Yeah. I am a hype man. I am. <laughs> Uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, this is Psalm 91. It says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is He who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked." For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Amen. Well, that doesn't uh, like uh, tie in with what's going on <laughs> in our world right now. And interestingly, we're doing a study of the Psalms, which I know that you haven't been here at church. This is your first time, but that's what we've been looking at. And so uh, if you haven't been here before, this is not totally our normal programming, uh, but I think most of us have, have been here. We've got, we've got the family here today. We've got, we've got our normal crew. And so can I just ask that you guys, if like, just talk, make noise, laugh, like let's have a good time. The last thing I want to do is, yes, thank you. Louder. <laughs> Shelly, come on, louder. In fact, what I want you to do is wait till my most serious high point of the most emotional, you know, pitched point of the service and then laugh uproariously. <laughs> I know I could count on you, Shelley. Thank you. I just, so much, if you watch the news, so much is glum. I mean, so much is just so, so, so negative. Uh, even when you look at statistics of what's going on with this virus and viruses that have happened in the past and even flu, the just common, the flu that we deal with every year, it is statistically, it's just so much more 
deadly and destructive. And uh, man, we're just getting such a torrent of horrible negative news. The last thing I want is to come to a church, especially a church named Joy Church. <laughs> and it's like, oh, woe is me. Everything is awful. <laughs> no one's going to make it out alive. <laughs> just don't think that that's the case. Now, listen, I know that it is, um, it's taboo for a church or a pastor to, you know, brag about their amazing wealth, prosperity. <laughs> they call it flexing. The kids these days call it flexing. I know that it's, I know that it's kind of, you're not supposed to do that when you're a church, but I just, I just need to say this because I don't want to put any other churches down. I don't want to put any other people down, but I just feel like this needs to be said. I made an order last week, and a box is swiftly traveling towards my house. And in that box, 96 rolls of toilet paper. I don't, I listen, I, <laughs> it's uncomfortable to have this much wealth. Well, yeah, that's true. I shouldn't have said that. It's going to Noah and Sarah's house, just in case you run out. Uh, maybe. Not that I know of. I don't like to brag about my, our unending wealth or anything like that, but 96 rolls of toilet paper, which, is it funny to anybody else that all the toilet paper is disappearing at such an alarming rate? It is just, it's so funny, but what what cracks me up the most is that, like, I completely understand. I get it. Like, when you think about your life, when you think about the worst case scenario, the worst situation you could be in, probably nine times out of ten, it involves being short on toilet paper. <laughs> like, it, like, no matter what happens in your life, there are some things that you just want to make sure that you have covered. <laughs> and I, I, there's all kinds of puns that are going to work into this, and I, I want to make sure that I don't, I don't use them because it could get awkward, more awkward than I normally make it really quickly. <laughs> yeah, that's what we should do. It'll be a church fundraiser. We'll sell it as people run out, which people I think already are. It cracks me up. And now I understand, I do, I do get it. I get it when you're like, man, supplies might be low. I need to make sure that I have the things I need to survive. What's ironic is everyone's getting like humongous buckets of beans and toilet paper. You're like, you're actually going to go through all the toilet paper at the same rate. You're just going to go through more of it. <laughs> but I understand the sentiment. Like when I worked at Joy Medford, I was on staff and I took care of the grounds and maintenance and things. And one day out in front of the building, we found a white pair of stretchy pants. Is that shocking in itself? The white stretchy pants had been used up. Shelly, <laughs> people are going to hear you. They had been soiled. They had been used, broken in. And this raises some important questions. Number one, why wear white stretchy pants? I mean, first of all, there's just so much downside to wearing that kind of, that kind of choice. Hopefully you're not wearing them today, but there's just so much downside there. But it also, it also raises questions like, yeah, Mylanta. Maybe my Lanta could have solved part of the problem, <laughs> now that you come to think of it. Like, what happened to the person? Their, their pants are there. Like, the, the problem has already, it's already happened, it's occurred. Like, where are they? And what are they doing now? Like, there was no person occupying the pants. This is why you're like, you know what? Buying, stocking up on toilet paper, this makes sense to me. Like, I get this. Do you want to know what I don't get? Our public health officials like WHO and the CDC and these people, they give us advice. And some of it's good, you know, wash your hands and sanitize and take care of things like that. I get all that. And then they give you this little nugget. Try not to get coughed on. Is anyone out there trying to get coughed on? <laughs> like, how do you avoid it? You're, like, <laughs> yeah, that's by yourself. But by other people, like, you'd have to see, does, does anyone here, like, get coughed on normally? Like, yeah. Hey, Chuck, I'm going to have to cancel the coughing party this weekend. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's a statewide thing. Mm -hmm. I, I know. I was planning on sneezing in your direction, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Best I can do is put some germs in an envelope and mail it to you. Cool? Okay. Yeah, we'll get it. Once they lift the ban, we'll get back to coughing on each other. It's such a weird thing. Make sure you try, just during these trying times, 
make sure you try not to get coughed on. Okay, but I promise that as soon as this is over, I'm going right back and I'm just letting anyone cough on me because that's just how I roll. Is that weird to anybody else? <laughs> try not to get coughed on. <laughs> try not to get sneezed on. What? It is now? Yeah, you're welcome for clearing that up just in case your day wasn't weird, weird enough. But we are taking this whole coronavirus thing seriously. I know that I'm joking around about it to try to you know, lift the mood and have a good time and just kind of contextualize where we're at. But, you know, as a church, we are sanitizing everything. We sanitized as, as much as possible. We sanitized all the seats and, and armrests. We sanitized the bathrooms, everything we thought we'd be touching. I don't think you can completely insulate yourself, but we sanitize everything we can. We've got hand sanitizer at the info center. We've got hand soap, uh, in the bathroom. I'm saying that like it's not normal. Like normally we don't have any soap in there. It's just every man for himself, but uh, we've got soap in there now. And we actually are listening to health officials. As you probably know, uh, Governor Kate Brown has instituted a, a ban, a statewide ban on, on large gatherings, especially gatherings over 250 people. And um, I think that when it comes to government, when it comes to our, our beliefs, there are some things that it does make sense to be contrarian about. You know, I think when it comes to issues like, like abortion and, and moral issues, I think that it is we you should take a stand. Something like this, I don't I don't think that it makes sense to be contrarian and say, hey, anything that comes out of the government, I'm not going to listen. I'm going to do my own thing. This is not the kind of thing where I think it makes a lot of sense to do that. And that being said, um, we're going to see what it looks like over the next few weeks to maybe go to like an online sort of service. And so. Um, like I was getting at earlier with our dream team and all of you wonderful people that volunteer uh, here in the house, um, if it gets to the point where it's we're, we're just basically covering the position the positions we have, it might be easier and better for everyone and safer to just uh, stay at home. You can stay in your PJs like you normally do until noon. You know, you can eat your uh, you know cookies and cake for breakfast and watch church online. I mean, let's just. I mean, all of you guys are like, I never do that kind of thing. <laughs> That's totally weird. Yeah, right. What's that? Oh, yeah, we'll just tell, hey, you're number 250. Sorry, you got to get, yeah, get out of here. I don't know if that's totally our problem. <laughs> but uh, we are considering uh, doing that. And here's why. The church is not just a place that you go to. It's not just a building, a church building that you go to, and then you are a human at church. That is part of it, and that's a big part of it, and I, I'm, I encourage that part of it, gathering together. But the church is supposed to be something that you are. You, you as a human, as a Christian person, are the church. You are part of the church. And so being a family together does not stop just because we're not meeting together. It's not gathering together. We can still communicate. We can still have relationship. We can still um, talk about what God is doing and what's going on in our life. Church can still happen because church is something that you're also supposed to, to be, to participate in, and you don't have to be at a physical location to do it. But as soon as we um, find out what the news is, what we're supposed to be doing, how we're supposed to meet, you know, whether there's statewide governmental bans on, on getting together in large groups, we might consider that. So that being said, and the reason I'm taking so much time to say it is uh, watch our Facebook, watch your email, watch, I mean, we will try to get a hold of as many people as we can in as many ways uh, that are possible to let you know if there's not going to be church here at the building in the Rogue Theater next Sunday, then we'll try to let you know so that you can log in or you can make your plans. We don't want people driving around and making a trip and then uh, be surprised if, if we're not here. So uh, look out for that. Last week, we started a new series, and it's called Diary of a Human. And you have to be very careful when you're saying those words quickly, and especially when you're joking around about toilet paper. I mean, there's just, there's so much going on. Diary of a Human. And we've been looking at the Psalms, which is why it's fitting that you read a Psalm. And um, it's interesting because uh, the Psalms are are what are called autobiographical. Most of them, or a lot of them, and it's different than a lot of um, other scripture. Other other scripture, when you read um, uh, maybe a, any of the other books, it's it's kind of communicating from God to man. God is saying this to man. Here is my doctrine. Here is what's right. Here is morality. Here is whatever. And a lot of the Psalms are autobiographical in nature, which is more of a man to God. 
David or someone else, the writer of the psalm, to God. And I think it's an important distinction to make. It's, it's good to know why we're going through psalms and how to read a book like the psalms. Because if you've ever read a history of someone before, oh, this is Abraham Lincoln or this is Ben Franklin and they did this or they did that, or they, some, some historical fact happened during their time, you're like, okay, there's some information. But when you read something that is like a diary, it is a, a journal or a, an autobiography. You're actually reading what the person, when they went through that action, when they did that thing, when they operated in some way, you're reading how they felt about it. You're reading what they thought about it in real time. And how many of you think that that's helpful? You know, when you, when you read about someone who did some brave thing, they did some amazing act in history, you go, wow, I'm glad they did that. But you just see it as a bare fact. But when you read their journal and they say, I was freaked out of my mind. I was scared. I was so nervous. I didn't think I was going to make it through. Everyone hated me. And you, and you read their actual emotions that they put down. You go, oh, that's actually kind of comforting because that's how I feel a lot of the time. I feel freaked out, and I feel like uh, I'm not going to make it, and I feel like everyone's against me. But still, people throughout history have made right decisions and done great things, even though they've felt in their heart, they felt in their emotional side that um, things were falling apart. And I think that that is so helpful when you're looking at a book like the Psalms, because you read some of the Psalms, and it doesn't sound like other scripture. It doesn't sound like, hey, everything's great, God's good, and you're good, and we're all good. Let's just, you know, sit around and sing Kumbaya. Some of the Psalms are like, everyone is trying to kill me. I, God, strike them dead in your anger. Go, go get those guys, God. Go, how could you let this happen? I am so mad. I am so freaked out. And you're like, whoa, David. You sound kind of like me sometimes. <laughs> and it's true. It's, it's autobiographical, not all of it, but some of it, a good portion of it is autobiographical. He's saying, this is what I'm saying to God. And I think this helps us because it lets us know that we can say to God what we really think and where we really are and what we're really feeling and what we're really going through. And God can handle it. He can take it. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. And then you read what this guy after God's own heart wrote, and you're like, man, this brings me great comfort because this guy was freaking out. This guy was like yelling and screaming at God and just like losing his mind. And sometimes I feel the exact same way. And so it's comforting. It, th it helps us to, to look at scripture in the right way, look at it in its proper context. And so we're going to read through a psalm, uh, Psalm 34 today, and then we're going to kind of unpack it a little bit. But sometimes um, I get to unpacking and uh, I don't get through enough scripture. And I don't want to just give you my thoughts and opinions. I want to read the scripture and let it talk for itself and then help drill down to a little bit. Psalm 34, starting in verse one, we'll read the whole chapter. I will bless the Lord at all times. I think this one has the superscript. Yeah, it does, but I'm starting. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Anybody have any fears running around out there? Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, talking about himself, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days? Hey, yo, right here. That he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Getting close here. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous 
will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. It's good. And there are some Psalms where you'd read through them and you'd get to the end and you'd be like, that's bad. (laughs) You wouldn't say that's good or you wouldn't feel that. You'd feel like you'd be lying if you said, wow, that's good. I feel encouraged because you didn't feel encouraged. And we're going to get to that probably next week. We'll get into some of the ones that seem a little less encouraging. And I think at the end of the day, they really are. But this Psalm is universally recognized as a Psalm of thanksgiving. That's, it, it's encouraging, it's upbeat, and God, you're, you're helping, and you're moving, and you're doing all this stuff, but it's, it's recognized as a psalm of thanksgiving. It's an actual category of psalms. There are some psalms that were written by David, and they, they mean to give thanks to God. They mean to instruct us how to give thanks to God together, and you're asking me. I can hear it. I can hear your thoughts right now. That's not true. I can't. That would be awful. It'd be more awful if you could hear mine. Um, why are we looking at a psalm of thanksgiving when so much bad stuff is going on? Why are, we, why are we talking about a thanksgiving psalm when it seems like there's less to be thankful about, uh, especially right now at this juncture that we're at in history? And my reason is, in my mind, thanks is the opposite of fear. Thanks is. You might not have recognized it, but in this entire chapter that we just read, thanks is mentioned zero times, even though it's a psalm of thanksgiving. Fear is mentioned five times. Five times. In a psalm about thanksgiving, the word fear is mentioned five different times, and it's easy to be afraid right now. A lot of people are. Watch the news. Talk to people that you know. People are living in fear. And here's here's why I think that thanks and fear are opposites of each other. Fear looks in, in worry, and thanks looks outward in gratitude. Fear anticipates bad things that might happen. And thanks remembers good things that have happened. They're completely opposite. Fear is... This virus is out there. The world is shutting down. I'm out of toilet paper. Anyone else just want to admit that if you just actually ran out of toilet paper during this time, there's no easy way to shop for it? If you actually go find some in the store, people are like, oh, you're freaking out. And you're like, no, I'm not. I just, we actually just ran out of toilet paper. It's just, just bad timing. But fear is anticipating something that hasn't even happened yet. If it had happened, it would just be a fact. You wouldn't be afraid of it. But fear is an anticipation, like there's something out there in the future, in the world that's going to come and get me and it's going to make my life worse. It's anticipating something bad. And thanks is the opposite. Thanks is remembering something good that has happened. Anyone here struggle being thankful enough sometimes? Thinking about your family, about your relationships, about what God's done for you, about being saved, about whatever it happens to be. It can be easy to live in fear instead of thankfulness. And that's why a psalm like this is so important. It's so, it's so powerful for us today. How many of you know that fear makes a decent thermometer? It can tell you what's going on. It can kind of give you the lay of the land, but it makes a horrible thermostat. You actually control the temperature with your attitude, with your, what you are thankful for, your, how you decide to live deliberately. Anyone here know any professional worriers, professional Fear mongers, if that's you, don't even raise. <laughs> is that you? The thing is, if if you say no, I don't know anyone like that. It's usually you. <laughs> you can turn it. They. It doesn't matter what it is. You can turn anything into like an end of the world situation. You're like, hey, it's nice. The sun's coming out. Yeah, right. Probably get skin cancer and die. And you're like, okay. Don't worry, the sun went back down. Oh, great, now I'm going to get seasonal affective disorder and a lack of vitamin D and die. <laughs> like, which one do you want? Like, you worry, but like, no matter what, you can, like, take a situation and make it worse by worry, by, by fear. It doesn't matter. What if I spontaneously combust? That would be awesome for the rest of us. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> What if those 
scary bugs in Star Trek Wrath of Khan are real. And they crawl in your ear and lay eggs in your brain and you become a mindless zombie. I don't know. Like, <laughs> you, you guys know people like this, right? It's like no matter what, they find a way to worry and fear about something. And it might be you. I, I, it might be me. <laughs> the glass is always half, half empty. It's <laughs> like... It's bad and getting worse. Everything's going to hail on a handbasket. You know, it's just living that way and, and being a, a negative Nancy, a Debbie Downer, a, I don't know, other name with a alliterative, you know, <laughs> depressing kind of theme. Fear. Seeing the worst in every situation. The worst is when you become numb to, to this being true of yourself. To you, it's not living in a negative mindset and, and having fear and being unthankful. To, to you, it's just normal. It's just your normal paradigm. It's just how you see the world. It's your worldview. Everything is awful. It's getting worse. There's no, there's, there's no way that I can win, that I can get better, that I can find God, that there's something good ahead. It's just that everything is, everything is awful all the time. And you can become numb to that. That's why this, this topic, especially at this time, is so important to me. Worrying about things, fearing things, having anxiety, that part is easy. Praising God and being thankful. Grateful in times when you don't feel that way is very, very difficult. That's why it says in Psalm 116, David is talking and he said, I will offer to you, he's talking to God, God, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Does anyone here think of thanks as a sacrifice? I'll tell you when you'll start doing that, when you make your kid say thanks for something. Hey, grandma just bought you a $12,000 Christmas present. <laughs> Why don't you say thank you? <laughs> That's all you could offer? That's all you could give in return. All, they, all they wanted you to do is just say one word in their direction. Thanks. That would have sufficed. <laughs> we, we notice it in that context. What if you do something for someone? You go and you give them a ride or you take them gas or you give them money or you help them out or whatever, and they just completely blow you off. They never recognize it. We're like, can you at least say thanks? Because we understand this, tra this transaction, and that's what David is talking about here. And as we're going to look at in the coming weeks, there were times in David's life that we would absolutely, I mean, lose our minds over how bad he had it in many, many, many situations. And still he found a way to say thanks and to bring a sacrifice of thanksgiving to God. Do we do the same thing? Thanks is the opposite of fear. And I think that the answer to this, the way that we should read into this is in the very first verse of this entire passage. Chris, do you mind throwing 34 uh, verse 1 up there? So the, the, the first sentence here is actually the superscript. That's not canonical biblical language. What happened is that that was added to the Bible to explain where this psalm came from. The actual psalm starts at the second sentence. And it says this, I will bless the Lord sometimes. <laughs> I'll bless the Lord when there's no coronavirus going around. I'll bless the Lord when all my bills are paid. I'll bless the Lord when my kids aren't mistreating me. I will bless the Lord at all times. I will bless the Lord. I will bring the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And I will live my life in a way that it is a blessing to God at all times, all times. It doesn't matter if it's sunny or raining. It doesn't matter if I feel good or bad. It doesn't matter if I have money in the bank or not. I will bless the Lord because God deserves for me to posture myself in that way. Thanksgiving is a posture. This is the point. Thanksgiving is a posture that you take. It's a, it's a decision that you make. It is a, it is a, a deliberate 
moving of your will and of your desires and of how you feel and making a decision in spite of that and saying, I don't care how bad things are. I don't care how fearful the situation is. If I live by that, my life is going to be awful no matter what. There are people who find a way to be fearful and miserable even when times are good. But Thanksgiving is a, it's a posture. There's a verse in 1 Thessalonians Chapter 5, verse 16 through 18, Paul is talking to the church in the New Testament, and he has a similar sentiment. Verse 16 says, rejoice always. Doesn't that look funny? It's like a tiny little verse all smashed to the side. Like, that's the whole sentence. That's all of verse 16. Rejoice always. Be full of joy. Control your attitude and where you're coming from all the time. Go to the next verse. It's funny, too. Pray without ceasing. Your life should be completely characterized by prayer. Go to the next one. Give thanks in all circumstances. Thankfully, it doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances. In the, do you know why he's commanding to give thanks in all circumstances? Because some circumstances are terrible. You don't have to say that when things are wonderful. You have to say that when things are awful. Give thanks no matter what the circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. That freaks me out. Paul is saying, give thanks, do, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in, in everything that happens to you. Why? Because it's the will of God in Christ Jesus. Like, man, that's a big statement. If you ask yourself honestly, do I rejoice in all situations? Yeah, I wish he'd quit saying stuff like that. <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you, he's damaging my self-esteem. <laughs> There's so much in the word about this, about being thankful. You say, well, it must have been easy for David. He was, he's the king of Israel, had all this money, had all these people doing whatever he wanted. He could write a psalm about Thanksgiving like this because it was easy for him. Fact of the matter is when this psalm was written or the event that this psalm was written about, David was not king. <laughs> He was being chased by Saul through the wilderness. And you know exactly what this psalm was written about? It's when he had to act like he was insane in order to escape from King Achish. There's an account in 1 Samuel 21. And if you read about it, uh, David approached this king looking for safety so that he could get away from Saul and the king was going to kill him. And so David's like, well, I don't have anything left to do. I have to act crazy. They said that he wrote uh, random scribbles on the gate outside in public, and when he confronted the king, he actually let slobber dribble down through his beard. Like, he acted like a legit, whacked-out, crazy, lost-his-mind person, and he escaped because of it. That context, when you know the context of why David wrote this psalm, it's totally different than like, oh, David's just living it up. Everything in his life was super easy. He had no problems whatsoever, just chilling. No, he wasn't. <laughs> He was being pursued, his life, by multiple people. And he had to act like a madman in order to escape. And after he got done, he's like, man, my life is, I'm writing a Thanksgiving psalm. That's what's coming out of me. <laughs> I'm just so thankful that God would deliver me. I'm so thankful for my life. Is that us? Is that our normal posture? Like, even when bad things are coming down the pike and we're, we're taking it on the chin and it's just it, things are not ideal, do, does a, a psalm of Thanksgiving come out? of our hearts and out of our lives. I have a friend like this who really lives this way. His name's Johnny. Some of you know him, a lot of you know him. He's from Joy Medford, one of my best friends. The guy is just so thankful and joyful and happy all the time. I just figure it's my job in life to take some of that happiness away from him and to make his life worse. Because it should be illegal to be that happy. If I'm not that happy, what the heck right does he have to be that happy? So when I was working at Joy Medford, I made him do all kinds of stuff. I made him do understructure. We were crawling under the building and fixing stuff. I made him dig out fence posts with me. Anyone dig out a fence post before? One of the worst jobs you can have. I mean, and he had blisters on his hands. Like his whole hand was just like both of them, like completely came off in blisters. Just smiles from ear to ear. Oh, man. Thanks for letting me come over. Thanks for letting me hang out. Like, oh, I had a great time. Like, I, man, I got to learn about understructure. He'll never do understructure in his life. He shouldn't. <laughs> oh, thanks. I, I, thanks for letting me come over and help. I mean, he has this posture of thanks. It just makes you want to punch him in his face. <laughs> and 
everything in, no matter what, even if someone evil like me is actively trying to steal his joy and his thankfulness because he's taken such a posture of thankfulness and gratefulness for just being alive and being saved, nothing gets him down. You know some of his most favorite places to be? In the slums in India. And their slums are like major league slums in Africa, in Cambodia. He's been all over the place. And people around the world know him. They're drawn to him because no matter, he doesn't need anything. He doesn't need some external money or acclamation or affirmation or whatever. He just has a posture of humility and thankfulness. And because of it, he's the happiest person you could ever be around. And I just want to tell you a secret. You and I have the same exact opportunity. We just don't believe what the Bible says a lot of the time. We think that there's something out there that when we get it, it's going to make us finally arrive at that place of happiness. And here's a tip. It's not out there. Thanks and gratitude and this posture of thankfulness is where all of that joy starts. It's where it comes from. It's what enables us to be fun and full of life and full of joy all the time, no matter the situation. And it's easy to forget this. It's just easy to forget as a human. And when you do, when you forget, when you, when you just bypass this and, and we forget the fact that, that Christ offered us something that there's no way that we could buy, there's no way we could attain any other way. When we forget the joy of our salvation. David writes about that in another Psalm, 51. The joy of my salvation. When we forget that that is the starting point, it's the end point, it's all of it, it's the whole picture. When we forget that posture. When we forget to live from that place, what we're left with is the fear and anxiety that's, that's left over. Don't let that be you. Whatever you're going through, whatever is going on in life, whether it's good, bad, ugly, whatever, let what be comes out of your heart be a psalm of thanksgiving, saying, God, I have life, and I have you, and I have what you've gifted me with, and I'm happy with that. And if you want me to do understructure, I'm going to smile. And if I get blisters, I'm going to smile. And if I'm in a slum, I'm going to smile. Because none of that compares with the eternal price that you paid to purchase me and to bring me back into your family. And if you're here and, and you haven't made that decision, if you think, you know what? I don't have that kind of joy. And I'm not talking about happiness or pleasure. I'm talking about joy. If you say, man, I, I just, I feel like, Everything that I've chased in my life has not delivered that. And I know that I need to make a decision to say, God, I want to come to that place of thankfulness. Where it starts is recognizing what you have to be saved from. And there's, everyone has a different experience. Everyone has a different background. We've all done certain things and seen certain things and been certain people. But no one is beyond God's grace. No one is beyond saving. And God wants you. Don't put the cart before the horse and think, I just need to clean myself up enough so that God can do something with me. It just doesn't work that way. We can't clean ourselves up. God cleans us up. God makes us worthy. God makes us into something. And that is where thankfulness comes from. If it's something that we were able to do and we were able to accomplish and then we could bring our, our bad self before God and be like, hey, I'm in the club now, check it out. There'd be nothing to be thankful about. That's just not the way that Christianity works. It's not the way that faith works. We're thankful, we're grateful to God because he has done so much. And he's willing to take on our sin and our shame and our brokenness and our failures. He's willing to take that on and through the power of the cross, become that so that we could have freedom and life and real joy. When you buy into that package, 
you are so thankful that God would even look at you and, and clean you off and make you into what he originally created to you to be, that it's difficult to have a bad attitude. It's difficult to be glum and sad and, and depressed and, and all of that and see that as, as a normal life. It's not. The Christian life should be absolutely jam-packed with joy and laughter and fun. That should just be your default mode. Not worried, not full of anxiety, not full of fear what's going to happen, not full of uh, do people like me, do think people think I'm good enough, all, all of that. that. That should not be default. Default should be, my gosh, God would create me. He would, he would destine me to be somebody. He would save me from all of the trouble I've got myself into. If that's you, I'd invite you to just pray this prayer. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you. No matter my situation, thank you. Thank you that I'm still alive. Thank you that you would offer yourself in my place. Thank you for your cross. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your obedience. Jesus, I pray that you make me live. That you live in me. That you restore the joy of my salvation. I know that I need you. I know that there's no other way that mankind can be saved apart from you. I need you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to pray for the rest of us real quick. God, thank you so much that you care for us. Thank you so much that you see us. And God, sometimes we get ourselves worked into this situation where everything is bad and everything, the sky is falling and, and all of that. And Father, we just repent of that. And God, we want the continual posture of our heart to be, thank you so much that you care so much. Thank you so much that you're there. Thank you that even though many are the afflictions of the righteous, that you deliver us out of them all. God, you care for us. And God, we repent from being stuck on our own thing and stuck on the success of our own life when really, God, we are just so blown away. We're shocked that you'd be so gracious to save us. God, we want to look more like you. We want to reflect uh, your graciousness to the world around us. I pray that you bless each person in here. Do a work in our heart that marks us from this day forward, God, that, that our life continually gets better because of the joy that's inside, not because of our circumstances around us. God, we look to you, the author and finisher of our faith, and we put our trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.